to drive your, your poor cameraman nuts because I don't tend to stand behind the podium. I tend to walk around while I'm talking to folks. My name is Brian Brown, my compatriot Ricky Roberts, and we're here to talk to you about Patrick Ferguson. And we're authors of the book, Every Insult and Indignity, The Life, Genius, and Legacy of Major Patrick Ferguson. Now, Patrick Ferguson was a scholar. He was born uh, near Edinburgh, not Aberdeenshire, as you'll see in some monuments to him. His father was a prominent jurist. His family were the middle class, uh, relatively affluent. His uncle is the Lord General of Quebec after the French and Indian War. So he comes from a military family. His uncle described him as a promising lad, a lad of some certain genius, but a little military man. He first joined the military in the Scots Greys at the age of 14. But when the Scots Greys went to war in Germany um, during the Wars of Austrian Succession, his regiment wisely decided that they did not want a 14-year-old second lieutenant commanding troops in the field and made him sell his commission back until he later got a commission in the 33rd. Well, as Patrick Ferguson grew and matured in the British Army, he becomes a student of Lord General Howe and his war, his light infantry school. Now in the 18th century, what you think of as light infantry is called La Petite Guerre, the Little War. Now in your day, you still call it the Little War, but you no longer say it in French, you say it in Spanish. When you say guerrilla warfare, you're not talking about monkeys. You're saying guerre, guerre, the Little War. Well, Ferguson's soldiers of the Little War he knew that his men needed something with more reach than the 80 yards of a standard infantry musket, firing three to five rounds a minute with a range of 50 to 80 yards against a man-sized target. But they needed something with a higher volume of fire than the muzzle-loading rifles of the era, firing one round a minute with two to 300 yards of range against a man-sized target and not able to fit a bayonet. And when we go outside a little bit later, I'll walk through the manual of arms on the weapons and you see what they look like. But the standard infantry musket, the king's arm, the brown vest, is a smooth bore weapon. Now, I like to describe the brown vest as not being a firearm. A brown vest is a transport and delivery mechanism for a bayonet that happens to shoot. It's incredibly muzzle heavy, way too heavy to shoot at. <coughs> the Ferguson rifle is sometimes accused of being useless because it's too heavy. That tells me that those historians have never touched a Ferguson rifle. They've only handled brown vests. Now it looks a great deal like a brown vest. And this will become more important later on. It's a little shorter. If you have a light infantry car, you never really sent. But the balance is nothing like a brown vest. And where a brown vest and most arms of the period load from the muzzle. The Ferguson rifle loads from the breech. Seven rounds a minute out of a rifle. 200, 300 yard sights. These sights are dead on. This is the highest volume of fire of any weapon for the next 100 years. Now, some people say, well, Patrick Ferguson didn't invent the breech-loading rifle. Well, he knew that. His patent is not, I invented the breech-loading rifle. His patent is improvements on the breech-loading rifle. So saying, well, Chomet invented it first. Well, that's true. But Chomet used a screw four and a quarter turns to open the breech. Four and a half, it falls out. How many of you think you can keep track of that difference under combat? <laughs> no. Ferguson's breach uses 11 parallel threads in what we would consider a Morse gear today. We wouldn't call this a screw, we call it a Morse gear. And by having those 11 parallel threads, that lets it open the breach completely in one rotation. Two rotations takes it out. Doing it in one single rotation means that you have an excellent index to mark when to stop turning. 
<laughs> One, your thumb catches the stock. You drop the muzzle down. You drop your ball in, your ball rolls forward and stops on the rifle. You dump 75 grains of powder behind the charge. You close the breech. You cut a 67 grain compressed charge behind the ball. You sweep seven grains into the pan. You're ready to fire. Seven rounds a minute. Now, some people say, and we'll segue back to Brandon Wine later, that there were no Ferguson rifles in the Southern Campaign. We we'll point to a couple of things. One, Ferguson's second command, Allaire, talks about Ferguson's 100 riflemen, his core cadre, armed with his rifles. At the Battle of Kings Mountain, you have Campbell and Shelby both talking about Ferguson's riflemen driving the Americans from the knob with their bayonets. There is only one rifle issued by the British that mounts a bayonet. The Ferguson rifle. And they comment that Ferguson's men reloaded while advancing up the hill as Ferguson trained them to do. If any of you have ever been there to Kings Mountain, the lower knob where Ferguson and his men were is incredibly steep. And I've tried running up and down that hill loading a long rifle <laughs> and a Jaeger rifle and a carbine and a Ferguson rifle. And the only one I could ever load was the Ferguson. I've been handling black powder muzzle-loading weapons for almost 30 years. I'm not new at this. Why does Ferguson hold the low part of that ridge line? It's where the water was. All he had the militia up on top where they were safe. He held where the water was. Now, let's talk about the mythology of the Battle of Kings Mountain. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Patrick Ferguson was not sent to defend the Western Frontier. Patrick Ferguson was on a recruiting mission, raising up militia to reinforce the British Army. He had 1,800 green-as-grass militia in the first 60 days of their militia duty. They were going to Charlotte to meet up with Cornwallis <laughs> to get boot camp. If Ferguson was being sent to hold the western frontier, he would have had more than eight days of food for his entire column, and was down to three days of food at the beginning of King's Mountain. He would have had artillery with him, not armed solely with Charlottesville muskets. People like to think of the British on the Battle of King's Mountain defending the hill with their brown vessels. Near as we can tell, there was one Brown vest at the Battle of Kings Mountain, and it was on the American side. All of the British troops were armed with captured French Charleville muskets from the Battle of Charleston, <coughs> the Siege of Charleston. And then we have the famed fire and sword message sent over the mountains. You're really going to take them off, ain't you? Oh, yeah, I'm going to wind them up. <laughs> Patrick Ferguson is a professional officer. Patrick Ferguson does everything in triplicate. He does his requisitions paperwork in triplicate. We know that while in Charleston, while getting the, the Charlottesville muskets, they didn't have enough bayonets. So he had the blacksmiths in town fashion not daggers with the handles turned to fit into the bore of a musket. Plug bayonets. They didn't even know what to call them. They were so I hadn't heard of them. But Ferguson had those made. He, re he has copies of that requisition in his records. Every letter he wrote to his sister for 24 years has copies of that record. When Patrick Ferguson sent a note to Tarleton asking, when are you going to join up with us to meet back in Charleston, that letter is sent. The warning that Patrick Ferguson did give to the Americans when he was stirring up the loyalist Americans. Stand up, ye men of valor. Stand up, lest your women turn their backs upon you 
and you'll be pissed upon by the mongrel dogs. <laughs> now, that's pretty earthy. Now, that's pretty earthy. I, I like that. I got a point across. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> is very much a secular Scot. In almost 30 years of correspondence that we have for Patrick Ferguson, not once does the phrase fire and sword ever appear. Ever. This man is a member of the Hellfire Club. These are young British officers of enthusiastic appetites. These aren't fire and sword kind of guys. They don't quote the Bible and stuff. However, the American militia colonel, Reverend Dokes, a Presbyterian, one must be careful, <laughs> uses the phrase fire and sword in his sermons like I use commas. <laughs> and it's the only official document Patrick Ferguson didn't write down. Hmm, me thinks Ferguson got on the wrong end of some propaganda. Right? There's a problem here. Now, did Dokes use this opportunity masterfully to stir up the American militias to come over the mountain? Because if Ferguson is successful in raising these militia troops, Ferguson has changed the tempo of the war. The Battle of Kings Mountain is the cornerstone of the war. If Ferguson gets these troops back to the British Army and starts training up these troops and they're able to perform, but if he has Americanized the war, just like we're doing overseas now, we don't want our troops doing everything in Iraq or Afghanistan. We're training up the locals to defend their own homes. Guess what? It's not a new concept. The British were doing the same thing here. And if they were successful in holding those troops, the war likely would have had a very different outcome. But because Campbell and Shelby were able to, to break Patrick Ferguson on King's Mountain, or Patrick Ferguson said, God himself did not remove me from this mountain. So far he's right, he's still there. But in natural, <laughs> well he is. <laughs> it's kind of fun to sit there and watch people going up to the Cairn and ask why do they have a rock in their hand? Because if they're of loyalist descent, they're saluting Patrick Ferguson by recognizing his grave by putting a stone on there to raise the cairn. If they're from the American mythology, they're putting a rock on there to keep him in. <laughs> <laughs> and then the rangers at the Park Service go down once a month and pick off all the new rocks and back in the dish and just try to keep the cairn in the So don't move the rocks. But by capturing those troops, they force Cornwallis to chase Green, Campbell, and the American Army. Because if he does not recover those militia troops, Americanizing the war in the South and rolling the, the colonies up from the South and moving north is doomed. So, Cornwallis has to chase General Green into Guilford's courthouse and is so desperate to stop Green from getting away, he fires artillery into his own troops. He burns his baggage so he can move faster, chasing Green back across the river to a small skirmish you may have heard of in Virginia called Yorktown. Kings Mountain is a very critical battle. Now, a lot of historians say Ferguson's rifle wasn't there. Well, we're pretty sure Patrick Ferguson didn't have one there. His right elbow had stopped a musket ball for any wine. He'd been bayoneted in a friendly bayonet. Um, that's a hell of a story, isn't it? At uh, near the Battle of Monk's Corner. So his left arm is almost useless. So he's riding around on horseback wearing a red plaid duster, possibly a bat with a banyan, um, we're not sure of the description, blowing on his whistle, leading the troops around. So he's certainly not working his rifle. But of the dropped ball found on Ferguson's knob on King's Mountain, every single projectile recovered on top of that knob is British carbine ball, 615 ball. And in the archaeological survey done by the National Park Service in 2005, where they took metal detectors and swept the knob in other parts of the battlefield, they recovered a cock. This piece of the firearm is called the cock. 
from a fire lock on Ferguson's knob. <laughs> now, the historian that they had doing the survey for the National Park Service is a Civil War guy. And he doesn't know a brown best from a brown bed. <laughs> so he decides this thing is a brown best cop. <clears throat> yeah, not a brown best cop. And if you look at pictures in our book, you will see a photograph of that cop recovered on Ferguson's knob. You will find a photograph of a cock from a current reproduction Ferguson rifle, copied after the one made in the Minneapolis Museum. And you'll see a photograph of a cock from the British 1777 pattern tower rifle, which is what a lot of historians are trying to say was at the Battle of Kings Mountain today. You look at the pictures and you tell me what you think you're looking at. I know what I think and what all the arms historians I've shared it with, because we know after being captured at the Battle of Kings Mountain, that Ferguson's men took the lock screws out of their firelocks, it's a screw right here, and knocked the cops off their firelocks and trod them into the soil so the firelocks could not be of use to the rebellious colonists. So, interesting story. <coughs> now, Ferguson makes a weapon. A rifle capable of fitting a bayonet. Now, some 19th century historians are going to look at the length of this bayonet and tell you the length of this bayonet is evidence of Ferguson's vitriolic hatred of the Patriot cause. This is 19th century clap trap. <laughs> Some 20th century authors are going to tell you it's that long so that it looks pretty for King George on parade. This is 20th century clap trap. <laughs> this weapon mounts a bayonet that long for a very simple, very practical reason. It is the same distance, tip to butt, as the standard infantry arm of the day, the brown vest musket or the French Charleville. And what is bayonet fighting in its simplest form? It's two guys with a pointy thing on the end of a stick. Do you want to be the guy with the short stick? <laughs> no, they have the same reach. Now, if you notice something else about the bayonet, <laughs> now, notice it's bayonet on the brown vest. Most military bayonets were triangular like this. Now, Patrick Ferguson designed his flat. Anybody got any uh, guesses on why this is flat? It goes in here. Well, actually, uh, Ferguson was a Scot, and the Scots <coughs> called bayonets lungers. That was the best way to take a man out of action, just deflate one of his lungs. He's just flopping around on the ground, and you got to worry about it. They have a lovely saying, as with a bladder, a ball, let out the air, and so goes the sport. <laughs> this is flat to slide between ribs. It's also balanced to be a sword. It's got an excellent balance. So it's one of the first sword bayonets on the rifle. Now from there, at the Battle of Brandywine, we're going to segue over to Ricky. I'm going to hush for a minute. At the Battle of Brandywine, Ferguson and his men fixed their bayonets and charged across an open field at an American rifleman in a tree line, advancing across the field, maintaining three rounds per minute of aimed fire, 200 yards of accurate fire against weapons, maybe 100, with no bayonets, coming across the field. The American rifleman did the only rational thing they could possibly do. They ran away. <laughs> and as they came out of the tree line, I'm going to shush them. Well, as the uh, first of the men went into the woods, they just ran the uh, rifleman out. They were taking a risk because it was a hot day, and they, were, they just did a great deal of work marching across the field, loading and firing. So they were resting, and they heard horses out in the adjacent field. So they looked, and they were two Continental officers. 
Uh, one of them was dressed in the cavalry attire, real gaudy, peacock looking, feathers and everything. The other one was a really tall man on a big white horse with a, a blue and a green long coat and a ridiculously tall black cocked hat. First and first told three of his best shots to steal up and shoot those officers. And before they get loaded, he called them back because that's kind of like murder. There's two unoffending officers. So he decided he's going to step out <clears throat> and challenge them. So he steps out with his rifle and orders the two men to surrender. Okay, the one in the cavalry attire took off like a scalded dog. He's, he's looking for the next victim. The tall officer simply turned around and looked at Ferguson and slowly rode off, showed him his back. Ferguson said he would not shoot such a brave officer so coolly going about his duty. Well, later in the day, Ferguson got wounded, and when he was in the hospital recovery, he found out that George Washington was patrolling the field at that time. Anybody here thinks it would have made a difference if Ferguson would have filled uh, Washington full of lead in 1777? <laughs> We'd still be a British colony. <laughs> now, Ferguson said, however, had he decided to shoot this man, he could have lodged five or six balls in him before he rode off the field. And that gave me occasion for a field test. Because I've got the number of rounds and I've got the distance of 100 yards. So I set a board up. <laughs> Painted it white, set it up at 100 yards, and I fired six shots as fast as I could load and fire with this rifle. At six shots, one minute and 20 seconds. I could have got five shots under a minute. Do you think that would adversely affect his ability to stay on a horse? <laughs> <laughs> you turn the board around and see if that wasn't a real bit. That's not a real bit. 62 caliber balls. This thing's added out to 300 yards. Now, like I said, we've a uh, big discussion on, on Ferguson rifles and where they were. A lot of the uh, Ferguson rifles currently in U.S. museums were brought north as war prizes after the Civil War. So that means that they were down here and carried up. And uh, there's some of the early reports that came out in the 60s and 50s talk about Ferguson there with, with 100 of his rifles. And the uh, main historical uh, Folks have been busting that down for 200 years, and Brian and I are starting to find some evidence. Looks like they might have been right. Because the second in command said he was there with 100 of his rifles. Now, what would you consider one of Ferguson's rifles? If he had used the 1776 Tower rifle, he would have had to purchase them. There's no purchase record for him buying any rifles for his provincials. He probably had 100 guys with muskets and bayonets, provincials and uniform, and 100 riflemen at King's Mountain. Now, Laird actually surrendered after Ferguson was killed because he was down to only 35 rifles. So we kind of believe that there were actually Ferguson rifles there. I mean, he owned his rifles. He's got his name on it. He didn't have to buy new rifles. Rick, you got a hand up? Yes. Just a comment. Um, I'm, I'm a little familiar with this battle. And um, the uh, rate of casualties at that end of the field has always been the highest. If you break down the percentage, the uh, Virginians were the ones who had the highest numbers as well as percentage unit-wise Athletes, but very interestingly, of the, third, of the 14 men in the Virginia uh, group that was charging up the hill, 13 of them were officers of the hill. And I've always wondered why there was such a high rate of officers killed. And have you ever come across any instance where uh, Ferguson's uh, men at Brandywine were told to aim for officers? Well, in, in, in the, the documents of the 18th century, the, the journals on the 15th they tell you to target the officers. 
because your, your ball will bear bitter fruit. Men led are an army. Men unled are a rabble, and rabble die easily. Well, I know on the, on, on the Patriot side that was often the case, but I didn't know whether that was British doctrine or not. The, the, the British officers in the regular line, keep in mind, the British Army in the 18th century is not yet a professional army. It's beginning to professionalize, but for the most part, you're a spoiled younger kid that daddy got you out of the house by buying you a commission. And you've got a couple of people who really rise to the occasion and really stand up, but I mean, you know, Patrick Ferguson became a captain because the 73rd Regiment was going to the Fever Islands. Trinidad, Tobago, and the Bahamas, and the captain who held that slot didn't want to go, so he sold it at a discount. <laughs> and he bought a coronet, a sub-second lieutenant rank, so he could stay in England. So not all these guys are professionals. And you have an unprofessional officer, the idea of specifically targeting officers just really doesn't seem like cricket, old boy. Because you want to sell to spare Washington. Were you, were you aware of that uh, fact in terms of the numbers of officers killed in terms of higher percentage on that end of the field? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's good statistic, though. Yeah. It's never a place where Ferguson decided to put his, his stand rather than being the provincial. They were on kind of the hill. About, if you consider King Mountain Foot, it is being set up at the hill. And if you stand on that hill, you can look around and you're 70 to 80 yards from the hills across the river, which is the range of American rifles. Ferguson's men held the only position that could be fired on from the other rich lines. The other thing is, you know, why does Washington ride off calmly? Halt! Okay, what am I carrying? Sure. So if you think it's a brown bass and you're 100 yards away and a brown bass has an 80 yards of reach, you don't care. You don't care. If you get hit by a brown bass at 100 yards, God is mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> he has picked that ball up the last 20 yards and went bazinga. <laughs> First, his men are also wearing green jacks. He designed the jacket for them, and it's the same color green as the British light infantry who are carrying short muskets. Light infantry carbines. When we have them next to each other and we're demonstrating how the British bang the butt on the ground, we, we stop and pause to make sure we grab the right one out of the rack before we tap the butt on the ground. Because the Ferguson will convert to a kit in a hurry if you do it that way. If you've got a light infantry, sometimes we'll, we'll go like this and swap guns back and forth and turn around and say, who's holding the first? Yep. And that time you can't guess it. You can't see it past 20 feet. You ready to go out and burn some powder? Yep, I was just going to say, we're, we're, we're about to point where we're going to switch off to go outside. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to be outside the big windows there on the end. So if there's folks who aren't comfortable going outside to try and watch the demonstration, I'm going to try and find some place in front of the window so you can watch from inside. If you'd like to come outside, um, you're welcome to. Um, I may even decide to, by Flint behaves, to let a couple people take a shot at shooting for this right. So if y'all will join us outside in just a moment. And we're, we're shooting National Park Service.